Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Samir. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, to this uh, session and at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. The session is entitled, For the Sake of Peace, Jumpstarting the Palestinian Economy. Uh, I'm Mirak Dushek. I'm Managing Director uh, at the World Economic Forum. Um, I'd like to first uh, introduce uh, the people that are here with me, and then I'd like to give you a little bit of context on the title, what we mean by it, and then we should have a really, I hope, frank discussion about how we can make some progress uh, on, on the issue at hand. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, my friends here on the stage. Let me start here. Mael Gavet, you are Chief Executive Officer of Techstars. If you can give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, Hashem Shawa, Chairman of Bank of Palestine. Yossi Vardi, Chairman of International Technology. So the context, um, I always say that about at least 80%, if not more, of all the sessions here at the annual meeting in Davos are really stemming from ongoing work we do with business leaders, civil society representatives, ministers, across all the issues that you see here. It's really important that, that uh, I share with you that there, are, there is a lot of work behind that. Now, this panel, I think, is the embodiment of that because um, I wanted you to know, and those who are watching us um, online, that uh, the World Economic Forum has been, uh, since the 90s, heavily involved in how we can support dialogue uh, and how we can support um, a pathway to the two-state solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I just wanted to be very clear about that. We have been uh, providing our platform here in Davos. We've been providing our platform elsewhere to try our best. It's a very complicated issue, but try our best. Now, part of that overall framework is an initiative, um, a, a, a breaking the impasse initiative, a special dialogue that we are holding um, um, between and among uh, business leaders from the Palestinian society, from the Israeli society, and they're really working together uh, we uh, got together uh, 2012, and we have been really in constant touch looking at what this community can do. Now, when the peace process was, uh, uh, let's say, in, uh, on the front burner, and you may remember the years of Secretary Kerry, uh, there was a, a, a huge momentum, and this community was uh, very visible and active uh, in support of that official track. But what I think is even more interesting that, as you all know, now we have a lot of headwinds, um, unfortunately, on that front. But that uh, the, the, the business leaders that are, some of them are here, uh, some of them are at home, um, but that they kept working together. So we're really very proud of that because the forum has been providing just a platform. We've been in touch, but it's really the work of uh, Yossi, Hashem, and, and all our friends in both communities uh, that are a testament to me that uh, uh, this kind of civic action, if you will, or civic momentum still has some strength and, and has, some, has some momentum in it despite the fact that uh, on the governmental front, uh, on the, on, on the diplomat diplomatic front, uh, the headwinds are quite strong. So I just wanted to provide you with that context so you don't think this is just a random session uh, that we are throwing together here uh, about, about the Palestinian economy. Now, what is important also, and sorry, I will then finish with that thought, is that um, uh, why we say, for the sake of peace, jumpstarting the Palestinian economy. So obviously, those of you who follow uh, the, um, the diplomatic dialogue, you know that it's quite a sensitive topic. You cannot, it's, it's not that economic cooperation is a substitute for peace. So I just wanted to make sure you know that. We're not naive about that. But it's really important that, uh, that you uh, don't ignore 
the realities on the ground. It's just because there isn't uh, peace right now or, or, or a peace agreement, it, 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 if you ignore the realities on the ground and you don't invest in the Palestinian economy and Palestinian society, you're actually undermining the prospects for peace in the future. You will have a more fragile society that, is, that, that, that has less growth, more unemployment, and um, while this is then the ambition for this session, we'll be talking about that. I think, Hashem, you will cover the state of the Palestinian economy. And let's face it, we have seen headwinds there too. Um, uh, and uh, of course, COVID and also some of the repercussions around food prices and energy prices also stemming from the war in Europe uh, has, uh, have not helped. So I just, again, just for the sake of context, I wanted to share that with you. And now I'd like to go um, to Yossi Vardi, if I can start with you, um, because you were at the, uh, uh, at the inception. Uh, you actually were one of the co-initiators of this whole initiative back in Istanbul when we met for the first time. So um, I would like to ask you, uh, why is it that you are still in it, frankly, because it's, <laughs> It's, it's been such a long time, and uh, we haven't really succeeded yet. And so uh, you want the, why are you in it? You want the true answer or the formal <laughs> answer? The true answer, you know, I'm, I'm together with Talma already 59 years, but I'm still under evaluation. <laughs> so, so I want to impress her, but I have. Talma, I'm sorry. But the. <laughs> The, re the reason, it's, it's becoming a little personal, but I will tell you, when I was in the government many years ago, we had the, the peace agreement with, uh, with Egypt, uh, and I was responsible to the, to the oil part of it. And I can tell you the day that Sadat came to the Israeli parliament, I still can feel a dis minute, the goosebump, you know, like, like when you are witnessing that a peace is happening, I don't think that there is anything which is more exciting, more holy, more optimistic. You think about the fact that mothers will not have to shed tears on their killed sons. It's really something extraordinary, you know, and I, I was lucky to participate in the, in the Egyptian peace and then also in the Jordanian peace, and I even spent a good uh, two months in white plantation trying to negotiate peace with the Palestinian. And then it, it takes you to all kinds of thought, you know, on, on meaning, meaning of many things that I don't want to to share. I think this is simply, if you want to work for a cause, I, do, I cannot think about any cause which is more correct or more important or more moral or Im impact the life of many people more than, than being engaged in this thing. So this is, this is the reason. And also, you know, because of the little, the little Grim, grim probability. You know, right now this, the political situation between us and the Palestinian is not in its peak. I would say, uh, carefully. But even if there is one percent of one percent of one percent of chance of arriving to this, I think that any any just person have to work on, on it. Thank you. Um, Hashem, the same question to you. Um, why are you uh, part of this initiative and continue to be and, 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 and actually leading it? Um, but also then uh, I hinted it uh, would be good to have a mapping of, the, of where we are with the Palestinian economy. I mentioned some of the headwinds. So over to you. I'm in it because I just like, I love this guy. You know, he's, uh, how can you just not be in something where you have someone Go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that, is that okay? Is that what we... <laughs> no, but really, just quickly, first and foremost, thank you, Merrick, and thank you, the WEF, for just being a marathon runner with us. And I know, I know Professor Schwab has been 
stuck at this passionately, personally, for decades, and, and for him and for you, I know this, this is, uh, we know this is special, and uh, frankly, putting Palestine, Israel on the agenda, amongst all the <laughs> things you have on the agenda, which, you know, from climate and our planet to the whole host of global issues, um, we really appreciate that you keep you keep putting uh, Palestine on on your on your agenda and 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 joining the call for action for you know like-minded partners and friends that that um, that like you said Yossi want to do something just impactful transformative for the region and not just for the region for the world I mean the Israeli Palestinian. Uh, issue, conflict, occupation, so many people call it different things. The big elephant in the room, in the world, in the universe, it's, it's a big deal, mm -hmm. right? And, and we all want to, um, you know, one day you all, everyone asks themselves, you know, what, what, you know, when you leave this world, what do you want to look back on and say, what did I do? And what did we do? And, and I think we owe it to our children and our future generations that we, we all work together at this. And there will be always people that want to undermine and, 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 and uh, put hurdles and, and try to, you know, come up with narratives that, um, you know, that, that totally try to dismantle or disrupt what the efforts we're trying to do or call us you know, what, depending on which side you're on, um, different <clears throat> names, but um, we're sticking at it and uh, we see the value. Um, and like you said, Merrick, I'm really glad you highlighted specifically that um, this is no substitute for political horizon and uh, political process and justice and freedom and an end to this, uh, this longest uh, historic uh, you know, uh, occupation and, and, and um, to try to make sure that, you know, you highlighted that it's not a substitute and, and that's really important because w while we're against, you know, economic peace and trading, you know, trading off with, with rights and, and freedom, um, uh, you know, we're, we're not against a real genuine impactful economic development initiative, you know. But ultimately, we want freedom, we want rights. Yeah. And I think the call for action now is so timely because, um, and, and talking about initiatives that can create that and sustain resilience and strengthen and scale up resilience and, and keep people hopeful and, and create jobs and, and, and uh, prosperity agenda is important because, you know, at the end of the day, the alternative is dark, is, is bleak. It's not in anyone's interest. And, um, and so, you know, that's what the Bank of Palestine and all our partners, and I have to recognize, we cannot do anything without partners, from partners on, on our Israeli colleagues and friends to the WEF, um, you know, to, we have, I want to recognize also Dr. Mohammed Mustafa, chairman of the PIF, our sovereign wealth fund. IFCs, the development organizations, foreign investors in this room that have, that believe in our story and, and despite all the headwinds and all the negativity still invest. You know, we're, we're typically Palestine has been a, a charity case uh, lens, you know, mainly donor and, mm. and uh, funding, for, you know, to support mainly humanitarian issues. But I want, that's the perception, but I want you to realize that actually for every dollar of donor aid, <clears throat> That, that Palestine has received, there's been about two and a half to three dollars of, of investment by private sector, whether it's Palestinian private sector, don't forget there are five million Palestinians on the ground that are still there day in, day out, putting, you know, taking their kids to school, educating their kids and putting their capital and their wealth and their generation from family generation to generation, putting their investment into their businesses from the small to the big and that is is not going to end and and uh, that gives us hope and that's something that the bank with its partners has been scaling up on all levels thank you so much hashim uh, if i could go to you mael uh, so we now started talking about the palestinian economy 
Um, Hashem, you said that there is this shift that maybe before it was more around um, eight, but I know you've been really on the front foot and, and you will talk about it, I think, more about some of the initiatives that we're doing with the initiative, uh, with, uh, with the, some of the projects we have on the ground, but uh, entrepreneurship, startups, are part of that being on the front foot, uh, proactive uh, on, on the economy. Uh, Techstars that you had, Mile, uh, is known in the world, uh, around the world, that you really are uh, helping create these ecosystems and boost them. So what are the signals you're receiving when you talk uh, about Palestinian entrepreneurs or with Palestinian entrepreneurs? Uh, what are the signals you are, you are, you are getting? Yeah, so first, thanks for um, inviting us on this stage. I have to have to disclose to people, Yossi was one of my first mentor when I was a young entrepreneur a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, Hashim and I, we met, what, six months ago? Mm -hmm. um, and in Palestine. In Palestine. And that was a, a trip that I still remember. And, and uh, that helped me understand, and me and my organization helped me understand better uh, the potential that there is in the region. So we are the largest pre-seed investor in the world. We have three and a half thousand investment in our portfolio. Wow. And, and the way we do it is by developing ecosystem. We, we started our business thinking that uh, opportunities, so talent was distributed equally, but opportunity was not. And that as investors, we're, we're not a nonprofit. This is not a philanthropic conversation for us. As an investor, we believe that there are so many underserved, overlooked founders all around the world, people who don't even know that they could be amazing entrepreneurs because no one ever came to them to tell them, you have what it takes and there is an ecosystem to help you. And we see our job is to go and find these diamonds in the rough and help them become VC backable. We really, we are the deal flow to the VC industry. This year we're gonna make 800 pre-seed investments. Uh, and, and then we go to the VC and we're like, look at these amazing entrepreneurs that you would never have uh, thought about. And so talking about Palestine, finally going back to your question, um, we're very good at spotting signals. Like again, we, we, we make a living out of it. We, we look at regions and we're like, huh, no one is doing really enough there. Maybe we should go and look at it. And for us, Palestine has been uh, increasingly on the map because there is a high level of education. Uh, there is a young population. Uh, whether we like it or not, entrepreneurs tend to be on the young side. Uh, though we do have- Like do, us. Exactly, like us. <laughs> though we do have initiatives for older entrepreneurs as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, we also see an ecosystem that is being developed. Bank of Palestine is one of the main stakeholders in that. And, and that's important, an ecosystem doesn't, you, you can't have just entrepreneurs. Uh, you need to have the investors, you need to have government, you need to have infrastructure being put in place. And same thing, we're, we're seeing all these signals. Um, and then there is uh, what usually makes a huge difference, which is the necessity to be an entrepreneur. And uh, some of the best, again, we're, we're an investment business, some of the best investments we've made were in entrepreneurs uh, in businesses that had experience very challenging situation, very difficult ecosystem, very complex environment, and took from that strengths and a resilience which is um, really difficult to match in more develop, developed economy. And so we're seeing all of that, and we're like, okay, maybe we need to, we need to do something. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yossi, can I go back to you? Um, I said we will share a little more on uh, what uh, you've been doing, what we've been doing on the ground. Can you give some examples uh, what uh, this community has been focused on yeah. over the past years? Okay, I would like to, to start. You know how, what are the two ways to avoid the questions if you are uh, being interviewed? One is to say, I will get to it in a minute, but before that I want to say something and then you go, you know, to. And the other one is you tell the interviewer. It's a good question. This is not a question. The real question is. <laughs> so which one? I give you the choice. No, I will answer it. I would like you to answer the question. <laughs> Be before Very that, I want, I want to say 
to say one thing, and this is you allow me please to talk two minutes about the role of the forum. Sure. Because it's very important to understand the dynamic of such gathering. This di the dynamic of the gathering of the Israelis and Palestinians, we didn't start by, by sitting together and singing Kumbaya, because we, we don't know the words even. <laughs> but nevertheless, we started with mutual suspicion. We started with big crises. Took us, took us two or three years until we began to feel comfortable until each one trusted the good intention of the other, of the, of the other side. While we were doing it, these people of the, the forum provided a neutral and prestigious uh, place to meet. And not on, only that, you know, both the Israelis and the Palestinians, we were looked at like, uh, are you going really to talk with the Palestinians? What kind of men you are? What is uh, It's not the right thing to do, maybe. And the same thing with the, the Palestinians. The fact that it's done under this framework, which is not a political framework, this is a collapse. This is a, probably the, one of the best platforms in the world for people to, col to collaborate, people from the industry, industry government, gov government to government. So the framework, I think, held the whole thing together for, for a long time, add to it the regional meetings, which is high time miracle that you will consider redoing them again, where we were able to meet in the region really provided a, a, good, a, a good and very important uh, framework. I am nudging Mirek because of our, our experience, and I will talk in a minute, in a minute I will get to your question. <laughs> according, according the Council of Foreign Relations, I think there are today 27 international conflicts. Conflict defined where somebody is killing somebody else because political conflicts are close to 100. And today there are 27, some of you know some of them and some, some you don't know. And I'm telling the, the forum all the time that they should create 27 initiatives like this because one of the most important one of the most important output is the feeling of trust and also the feeling of the, the level of compassion, which is rising up. I have here my good friend, Dan Vilensky. Dan Vilensky brought to Israel, I don't know how many companies you brought from America. Several. Several, how many, five? Five, how many of them went bankrupt? <laughs> One. One. <laughs> And one of them uh, got to what size? Uh, what is the size of applied material today in Israel? Over two billion dollars sales. To the, and, and he decided, he took it as a personal crusade to bring a company to, to Palestine. He goes to, the, to, to, the, to, to raise funds. He flew to, the, to, to Abu Dhabi. He, he drive everybody crazy that we will give him names of potential investors, and, and this is really wonderful, wonderful to see this thing, and the framework resulted in. Now you asked the question which I'm trying to avoid, you know, okay, where is the beef, you know, whatever, uh, other than this wonderful, yeah. well, what, what, what did you get in the, on, the, on the ground? So I can tell you the following. First of all, regarding the two, the two states, Solution we advance very much. I think it's a matter of weeks, if not an hour. Hours. We didn't before go the end of the month, right? before the end of the month. Yes, before the end of the month, but we don't say which month. So which year? And unfortunately, there is not much we can we can show. And uh, in this case, it's very easy for me to to push the blame and. At the end of the day, what we said when we created the, the, the thing is that we will give the leaders comfort if they are going to, to announce it, because announcing peace, I mean, I spoke about how beautiful is the peace, but 
people are not, not readily accepting it. You know, Mr. Rabin trying to make peace was killed, Sadat trying to make peace was, was killed. And this is, we thought that we will provide the leaders with the comfort that the business community is supporting them. So at least they will make a little check mark somewhere on the, on the way. And we will also try to, to work on it. But we are now, how many years, Muhammad, how many years you are now under our benevolent occupation? Forty-seven, I guess. No, I think more. From, from 67, who knows how mathematic? 20, 20, 20. No, it's more than 50. <laughs> he's, he's giving you a discount. Uh, you know, your investors should be a little bit careful. <laughs> 50, how much? 55. <laughs> no, not 75. This is our hope, you know, but uh, we are not there yet. So 55 a years. A long time, yeah. Yeah, we are laughing, but it's not a laughing matter. You know, you, you really, we need to cry. So 55, we are in this situation. We don't see where, where it goes. And, and this, is, this is a big problem. And I don't know how it's going to be, to be resolved. In the meantime, we cut, yeah, like somebody told me, you know, if you are cleaning toilets, at the end, you get used to the to the smell. So we, no, no, we got used to the smell and it's not, not very good. Okay. You don't, you don't agree with what I'm saying. You agree. So this we can, we can only to deplore. And of course, you know, deep in our hearts, we always have the feeling that we could have done more and maybe we should have done more. So I don't have much to, to develop on this frontier. Yeah. However, it's too long. I should cut. That was a good, like, one minute to yeah. wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> thank oh. you. Uh, thank you, Yossi. I think. No, uh, no, but let me say at least one <laughs> first thing. Okay. We accomplished. One minute. Okay. What we accomplished on the ground, we started six working groups that were able to do certain things. I think some of them are very nice. We help, you know, it's not. Only our work, many, many people in Israel are involved, but altogether, we have now a community of 2,200 young Palestinians, which are working for the best roster of companies in the world, like HP and NVIDIA, and really the top of the top. Some of them are doing it from Gaza, and this is really a, ray, a big ray of hope, and, and the momentum is there. It's now growing. Where is Yaron? Yaron Haklai, where are you? Raise your hand. He's doing the work in the ground. He told me like five months ago we had 2,000, now we have 2,200. Uh, there are 145 Israeli companies which are employing. It's growing, the number is growing all the time. You have, <coughs> you have Palestinian companies doing outsource work for international companies. If you have Ralph Lauren shirts that you buy online, the service which are doing the e-commerce are located in Nablus, which is mind-boggling. So uh, we were able to help to re resolve some issues with the Israeli administration, because when we go with the Palestinian to the administration, they listen in a different way. We have here among us the former governor of the Bank of Israel, and when needed, she is rolling your sleeves and go and, uh, and to, to talk with some people to resolve some problems on the issue. We were able to help in securing a budget, I think, for, for, the, for, for, the, for, for your health issues. So we are, we are helpful. We create some things. It doesn't resolve the problems, but it creates trust and it creates momentum and it creates positive vibe. So if I have to give myself a, a grade on our accomplish so far, I would say maybe seven, maybe a little bit less than seven. It's not 10, but it's also not zero. I don't know, he will give me three, I think, but uh, who cares, he's a Palestinian, so we don't care. Thank you, Yossi. Um, Hashem, <laughs> Uh, because I know you also, uh, you have a VC entity. 
So tell us a little more uh, so we can understand the Palestinian um, okay. startup ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, what is the landscape? Are you the only VC? Are there more? What kind of companies do we have uh, in Palestine? Okay. So I'll answer that question and then I'll talk about the other stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, Bank of Palestine since ever has been all about inclusive, sustainable development, right? And so we started off in 1960 in Gaza, uh, essentially a privately small agricultural bank focusing mm. on the real stuff, farming and helping farmers with loans in Gaza. You know, Gaza up to Tel Aviv or Yaffa was all orange groves back in those days. Leave Tel Aviv aside. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but we've, in that spirit, I mean, the bank is still very much a real economy bank. and, and really obsessed with long-term, inclusive, sustainable growth. So, and we, we take a holistic approach. So we, first of all, you know, I'd like to recognize my better half, my wife, Bernie, who uh, helped me really tremendously as we went back from living in Switzerland uh, in 2007 to go back to Palestine, uh, which was very, as you can imagine, quite a quite a shocking contrast from Geneva to Gaza, you know, quite a, two Gs, but different, <laughs> different Gs. Um, and 2007 was a tough time, right? Um, mm. I'm not gonna go into the details, but tough times. Um, but one of the first things I did, because after 15 years of working for the likes of Citigroup and HSBC and working with the biggest banks in the world, um, in, in different sectors and geographies, you know, I, I really use that knowledge and that support and partnerships, my amazing team at the bank and, and the board, to really push through transformational projects and programs. The first was to become, and I made that commitment at your WEF forum in the Dead Sea, do you remember, to be gender balanced by yep. 2020? You remember we, we did that announcement? And the bank, I'm proud to say, with, with a year and a half delay because of COVID, and we like to blame COVID a lot, but um, we became 50-50 at board level. You know, that's, you know, that's unheard of. I mean, that's unheard of in the banking industry. It's unheard of in our region. We're the first bank in the <coughs> entire MENA region to be gender balanced at board level. And it's not just a quota. I mean, we have like super top bankers and experts and technology, you know, minded and experienced women on our board. Um, uh, so it's not all about just, you know, plugging in the quota and finding some women in the corridor and putting them into the, and, and, and we're now at total level where, uh, bank level, we're at 40, 44% balance. So we're a little bit, you know, we're trying to get there, but we're, we're there. At sea level, we're probably around 35, 37%. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there. And in that lens, I want to tell you that I think if more women are in policy making, decision making, um, uh, impactful jobs, whether it's in government or private sector, you can get transform transformational change. And in that context, I'd like to say that that, that way of structuring the bank which is the biggest, one of the biggest you know, powerhouses in the economy. We make up 40% of GDP, one of the biggest employers, the biggest lender in the economy. Uh, we've proven that you can do good, you can be gender balanced, you can make loads of profit and succeed and be more resilient, even under a terrible occupation that strips you from freedoms. And by the way, women suffer the worst from the occupation in terms of the, the, you know, the issues that women face under uh, any military conflict, by the way, it's, it's known. They always suffer the worst. Um, despite all that, and like you said, Mel, we, we have some, you know, you said the diamonds in the rough. Uh, we have a lot of those. And, and women, um, I don't want to say, you know, there are a lot of diamonds. Are there low-hanging fruit that, that can really transform not only our economy, by including them into the economy, by giving them access to finance, empowering them, making them more involved in decision-making, 
Because then that gives you a balanced approach to, to, to running the business and solving problems. Mm -hmm. And we did that not only at the bank, but then that led to you know, other initiatives. Amber, where are you, Amber? There you are. Amber Amler, she's the part, uh, managing partner and basically brain and founder of the idea of setting up the first VC fund in Palestine. So please just stand up and so everyone knows who you are. <laughs> so Amber, like 10 years ago, said, Hashem, why, don't, why doesn't the bank champion startups in Palestine? I said, great idea. See, good ideas come from women. And so, so, um, so yeah, we, we started, you know, sponsoring hackathons and doing competitions and giving awards tw 12 years ago. Then we realized there's a lot of diamonds in the rough here, a lot of talent, you know. And a lot of that talent is going to work in Israel. Let's call a spade a spade. There's, you know, we're living next to and with the startup nation that is technology, you know, tech uh, miracle, let's say. And so there is that exposure, I would say, that benefits, you know, transfer of knowledge and exposure. Um, but we want to create opportunities in our economy. We want to empower young entrepreneurs and startups in our economy. We, you know, the occupation has cost the Palestinian economy billions and billions a year. I mean, I think half of our GDP is evaporated just by restrictions from the occupation. And McKenzie did a study on if just simple restrictions were lifted by the Israelis on the Palestinian economy, you could unleash, you know, double, you know, our GDP could grow by 200% or more. So, so back to the tech uh, uh, efforts, what we did was with the help of Yossi and our friends on the, on the Israeli side, you know, learning from their experience, you know, and they have some serious experience and having those networks and those, those doors that were opened and those relationships that were built and that know-how as well, coupled with our own money. I mean, we didn't take Israeli money or investment. We, this is, our, like I said, Donor aid from the international community, one dollar. We Palestinians and foreign investors yeah. have put three dollars. I mean, you know, and we leverage and we... And so we raised, Amber, the first fund like seven years ago, Ibtikar, which means innovation fund in Arabic. Um, Ten million dollar fund. PIF was one of our lead uh, investors. The bank was an anchor investor. Yeah. The IFC was, you know, I remember Yusuf, you had to go through hell to get the approvals in the system because yep. <clears throat> back in those days you know uh, it there wasn't it's a, it was the first vc fund it was a small fund there's no background there's no historical record so he had to push through a lot of exceptions and this is my my ask to you all palestine is for the brave it is uh, a risk country there's a lot of you know but we've proven like with things like whether it's the bank and our we're profitable we give you know, 15% uh, return on equity, high dividend, yield, despite all the restrictions because of our innovation and our resilience and our strength and our capital strength and trust by our customers and because of our gender balanced approach and inclusive approach to SMEs, real economy. But with, with the tech startups, the first fund was highly successful. We proved the model. We're now closing a second fund. Seven years later, we're doing another fund. $30 million, so three times bigger, investing in Palestinians in Palestine, but Palestinians wherever they may be in the region. And, um, and we're, we're attracting a lot of foreign investment into that. And one last thing, incubation and acceleration. This is where, you know, Maeli, it was great. Thank you so much for coming. And, 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 you know, seeing is believing. You know, when you come to our country and you see the reality on the ground, you see the bad, the good, the ugly, and you see the opportunities, right? And I think that's what you saw. And so it's those kind of initiatives, those partnerships. You know, we, we, we built five uh, innovation hubs, incubator hubs. Yeah. We're now looking in, in, the, in West Bank and Gaza. We're now looking to finally plug the last jigsaw puzzle missing in the, in the jigsaw puzzle <coughs> is acceleration. Uh -huh. So it's wonderful that we're, you're here, and we'd love to see eventually a, a tech stars with us. 
uh, and or just learn from you how you did how you did that around the world. Great. And try to scale up because one last thing, and I'll promise I'll end here. Yossi spoke a bit more than two minutes, so I'm allowed to speak a bit. No, you spoke I think much you're more. You're equal now already. So I'll just I'll just very quickly say you start that. Start again. I'll just very quickly say that honestly, time is of the essence, you know, and we're raising the alarm bells both. Both, I know it's a pun, <laughs> both Israelis and Palestinians, you have raising alarm bells about yeah. the, the situation. I mean, and it's, we're all worried that we're seeing the, almost the end of, of the two state solution. And we saw with the recent elections in Israel what's going on, and I don't know where things are going. Everyone's waiting and seeing, but things don't look good. Um, so that's why we must raise the alarms. However, not in a state of panic but to double and triple our efforts to protect our ideals, our values of democracy, international law, um, protect the economy and our resilience. Um, and, and it's a just, like you said, it's a just cause. Um, so that's, that's just what I wanted to cover. Sorry, it took a bit. Thank you so much. We left my uh, about 20 seconds. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mal, I'd like to go to you and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to um, uh, Abdul Malik Alawi here in the front row. Um, uh, and then Stanley Bergman. And, um, if, we have, if, if we can have mics uh, for Abdel Malik. Um, Mael, uh, could you tell us a little more about then the ecosystem or what did you discuss with Hashem? What are the, because what I want to make sure is people are also watching us. So what would be the types of startups or sectors that you're seeing in terms of opportunities among the Palestinian uh, entities there? So there is, um Right now, it's very much a blank slate. I think there is, as I was mentioning before, there's good education, a lot of young people, lots of influx of capital, as you mentioned before, uh, from outside of Palestine, and a desire to tackle a lot of big problems. So we've, we've talked about fintech, we talked about health tech, uh, we talked about ed tech, uh, all of the things that are actually really important and related to the challenges. Uh, Related to the challenges that the the economy uh, there um, there faces, and so look, the reality is that it takes time to develop an ecosystem. I agree with you. Time of the is of the essence. At the same time, based on our experience, we've been around for 15 years. We organize thousands of ecosystem development events every year to be able to make investments. Uh, and it starts with, as I say, going around and telling entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, you can actually be an entrepreneur. Then the next step is to provide them with capital because it's great to give people hope, but if you don't give them money, that's not going to go very far. So then you need to give them capital. Then you need to give them mentorship. A lot of what we're doing with our extra program is that it's because we take these entrepreneurs who have the desire we give them capital but if they have no mentors if they have no support they're not going to be successful and then you need to give them a network because no one ever succeeds alone and one of the things that we we bring and the reason why we're generally well received in the countries that we go in is that we bring 24,000 investors who have invested in, in a textures company and 8,000 mentors and when we look at at an economy that is that has all the sign that it could be even better than what it is, much bigger than what it is. Like for us, it's like, yeah, let's go, let's let's figure out how we can how we can make okay. that together. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Thank you also for being so crisp and focused uh, and inspiration to us all. That's what we're for, for, uh, for sure. Hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> for sure, she is not from the Middle East. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, we have two minutes, uh, so I'd like to go uh, to Abdul Malik, Stanley, and also I think Ami. Uh, but if you can be brief, um, Abdul Malik, um, because uh, so it's an outside perspective, but from the region, uh, Morocco has diplomatic relations with Israel, but also is supporting Palestine and the Palestinian economy. If you can tell us a little more about that. Well, um, thank you very much for including Morocco in this uh, conversation, and in one minute, all taxes included. Uh, I would say that we are a very old country. We're 1,300 years old. We recognize our Jewish heritage in our constitution. We have 500,000 Israelis that have either their mother or their father who were born in Morocco. And we're, we have always been uh, an honest broker in the conversation. 
And this position of being the honest broker is slowly shifting from political resolution to the economy. And we look at the Moroccan private sector, we're more and more interested in building bridges with Palestinian entrepreneurs. 100 Palestinian entrepreneurs were in Morocco uh, last, uh, in the last six months. They're looking at Moroccan entrepreneurs and at our experience, but also the role that historically we play as mediators helps business. The iconic example is very recent, the reopening of the Alambi Bridge. It was under Moroccan mediation. So our ambition as Morocco is to keep dialogue with both sides. We are for a two-state solution. But we do believe that although the economy cannot substitute itself to a peaceful settlement, it's one of the necessary conditions in order for peace to arrive more rapidly. Thank you so Thank much. Really quickly, Stanley Bergman and then Ami Applebaum, and then we wrap up. Rick, thank you for uh, continuing to sponsor these discussions. Um, I was born in South Africa, left for the United States. South Africa was at the brink of explosion when we left. Yeah, you can debate uh, corruption and all of that, but this, the political resolution occurred. Um, we don't publicize it. We have people, my company, uh, it's Fortune 500. We have people in Palestine on the ground. Remote work is now very much possible. It's not frowned upon. And I would encourage you to think about attracting foreign companies to think about remote work. People speak English, can answer the phone. It's done in the Philippines, it's done in India. Why not Palestine? And uh, areas such as dealing with accounts payable, accounts receivable remotely on behalf of international companies is now fine. It works. We've shown that remote works. And so I would encourage this dialogue, Marek, to continue. Don't give up. And there are opportunities for you to bring the world to Palestine. Thank you so much. And Ami Applebaum, and then we wrap up. Uh, so then after Ami, then Stu, and then we're really out of time, so, yeah. So uh, we have one minute, but I am um, good uh, students from y Yossi students. No, no, please, so, from mine. Uh, <laughs> the story is that I was uh, sitting on the plane, and the guy come and say, um, his name is uh, uh, Zamlot, and he's a Palestinian ambassador, and he say, I am your neighbor. And I said, what do you mean neighbor? I thought you are Israeli. He said, no, I'm neighbor. So I asked, neighbor from Jordan? He said, no, I'm not from Jordan. I'm from Ramallah. I said, well, Ramallah. And what is your job? I'm ambassador. And I asked him, so why we are two friends that sitting to, next to each other and we are not taking advantage on the each other capabilities? That Israel is a as mentioned rightly here, the startup nation, why we are not working together on the startup nation? And he said, Ami, how can we be, become a startup nation? And I said, I invite you to come to the company I worked before, KLA, and you will see what a startup looks like. And I can take you into some friend of mine that show you how you can give like a call services and so on. And he came. And he watched, and he saw. And I said, why don't we agree that we will go on what is possible, meaning that we will work bottom up and not top down. Mm -hmm. And bottom up, people will make business, people will work in the uh, high tech, like in a large company. We in Israel Innovation Authority, with I'm chairing, we can put together a fund that will work together like we do with many other of our, 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 our friends in other countries or even inside Israel to support and, 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 and they learn right. from each other experience. Mm. And that's my message to everyone. Let's do what is possible. Let's not continue to argue what's impossible. It's possible to have a strong economical relationship, a strong... And what, what the Innovation Authority is willing to do? We, everything that we can do with any other 
country that we are, because by law, we are serving only the Israel st uh, states, but we're working with many other countries, including United Arab Emirates. Why we should work with United Arab Emirates and not with the Palestinians? Thank you. Right? Thank you so much. And to close us off is Stu with his comment. Stu Eisenstadt. A practical suggestion. In the Clinton administration, we created something that Congress still has on the books called the Qualifying Industrial Zone. Yeah. In Gaza, which I visited as Under Secretary of State, we had 30 plants. All you need is a minimum of 10% Israeli content. You could ship back duty free. Those 30 plants employed 1,200 Gazans. The second phase was already being built, and then the second intifada occurred. There is no QIZ in the West Bank. And this would be a fantastic way. The law is there. The administration would get behind it. You would get, and those 30 companies were not just Israeli companies. In fact, most were not Israeli companies. They were Japanese, they were American, taking advantage of the duty-free treatment. So this is a practical suggestion. It's on the books, it can be done. And I think the forum can help mobilize this. Uh, Yossi knows about it, uh, so. It's a practical suggestion. We've done it also it. with Egypt and Jordan. In Jordan, it's created 150,000 jobs. 13 in jobs. Jordan. There are four or five in Egypt. Thank you. That's a good idea. Great. Thank you so much also for the practical suggestions. And uh, also just wanted to thank everyone, and particularly um, Yossi and Hashim, for keep driving it forward despite the headwinds. And also, we remain committed. Yeah. So thank you. We are not doing it alone. There are a lot of people. Thank you. Doing it.